Welcome to Westminster Abbey on the eve of Commonwealth Day. Now, each year, traditionally, a vibrant service is held, attended by the Queen, but this year is slightly different. The Dean has very kindly allowed us to invite some of the brightest and most talented performers in the UK into the Abbey to celebrate the Commonwealth. We're also honoured to have contributions from the Royal Family. Her Majesty the Queen will share her Commonwealth Day message and the Prince of Wales, the Duchess of Cornwall, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and the Countess of Wessex will join us in marking this very special occasion. Now, although they can't be here in person, we'll also be hearing from inspiring Commonwealth voices from across the globe as we celebrate the Commonwealth in 2021. Thank you, Dean of Westminster, for welcoming us to your Abbey. Um, it's wonderful to be in this magnificent building. Tell us about Commonwealth Day and its connection to this place. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time. It's been annual since 1972. It's a great occasion for us, and we really enjoy the relationship with the Royal Commonwealth Society. All, all the Commonwealth countries have national days, and on their national days, the High Commissioner and very often members of the High Commission come to the Abbey and will say prayers for them. So I've been here just over a year now, and when we were allowed, I was getting into the rhythm of meeting these people for whom the Abbey and the Commonwealth and that association was really important. We're, we're steeped in it here, and we've kept those prayers going uh, throughout this last year. At the moment, there's no international travel. People are feeling very isolated around the country. Why is it so important, do you think, to reach out and celebrate our global community? Well, one of the things the Commonwealth does is to remind us that actually distance doesn't stop friendship and commitment and of course we need to obey the rules at the moment but we also need to remember that our future is to be together uh, living together in peace and friendship and this service is a great reminder of what people can achieve together and what is her majesty the queen's role in the commonwealth she's the head of the commonwealth uh, and that's clearly critical but that doesn't quite tell you just uh, just what her significance is uh, over, over many long years, it's Her Majesty the Queen uh, who's told us what the Commonwealth is all about, uh, that it's about loyalty and friendship and a commitment uh, to peace and to freedom. She, she is the person who over and over again has put it into words. Uh, she also lives the Commonwealth. At her coronation, her dress was covered in the flowers of the Commonwealth. For her, uh, it is a way of life. And being by this coronation chair, uh, we, we just get reminded of the promises she made. That's an oath, and she's taken it seriously. Well, thank you once again for inviting us in. Thank you. the coming week, as we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity, and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. Whilst experiences of the last year have been different across the Commonwealth, 
stirring examples of courage, commitment, and selfless dedication to duty have been demonstrated in every Commonwealth nation and territory, notably by those working on the front line who have been delivering health care and other public services in their communities. We have also taken encouragement from remarkable advances in developing new vaccines and treatments. The testing times experienced by so many have led to a deeper appreciation of the mutual support and spiritual sustenance we enjoy by being connected to others. The need to maintain greater physical distance or to live and work largely in isolation has, for many people across the Commonwealth, been an unusual experience. In our everyday lives, we have had to become more accustomed to connecting and communicating via innovative technology, which has been new to some of us, with conversations and communal gatherings, including Commonwealth meetings, conducted online, enabling people to stay in touch with friends, family, colleagues and counterparts who they have not been able to meet in person. Increasingly, we have found ourselves able to enjoy such communication as it offers an immediacy that transcends boundaries or division, helping any sense of distance to disappear. We have all continued to appreciate the support, breadth of experiences and knowledge that working together brings. And I hope we shall maintain this renewed sense of closeness and community. Looking forward, relationships with others across the Commonwealth will remain important as we strive to deliver a common future that is sustainable and more secure, so that the nations and neighbourhoods in which we live, wherever they are located, become healthier and happier places for us all. Lord and I 
Bob Marley classics, Three Little Birds and One Love, performed by the ACM Gospel Choir and the Dole Foundation. And we're grateful to Rhys Edward for carrying the Commonwealth flag. Our next contribution comes from the Prince of Wales. On Commonwealth Day, I am reminded once again that the essence of the Commonwealth is its remarkable diversity. A family of some 2.4 billion people from 54 nations across six continents, whose traditions, knowledge, and talents offer an incomparable richness of ideas and perspectives on the world we share. When we gathered here in Westminster Abbey on Commonwealth Day last year, such a challenge was unfolding at a scale that few could have imagined. Twelve months on, the Coronavirus pandemic has affected every country of the Commonwealth, cruelly robbing countless people of their lives and livelihoods, disrupting our societies and denying us the human connections which we so dearly cherish. Amidst such heartbreaking suffering, however, the extraordinary determination, courage and creativity with which people have responded has been an inspiration to us all. This pandemic has shown us the true nature of a global emergency. We have learned that human health, economic health, and planetary health are fundamentally interconnected, and that pandemics, climate change, and biodiversity loss are existential threats which know no borders. Nature, it seems to me, is at the heart of this. She is central to all aspects of our existence, from the air we breathe, our nourishment and shelter, to our spiritual, cultural, and recreational well-being. Universal principles rooted in the harmony of nature's patterns, cycles, and geometry can, in fact, be harnessed to inform sustainably align science, technology, design, and engineering. Encouragingly, it is increasingly our young people who make up 60% of the Commonwealth citizens who instinctively understand how critical it is to protect and restore the natural world. The Commonwealth is on the front line of this endeavor. Over the years, having visited almost every part of the Commonwealth, I, I have seen for myself so many of the remarkable landscapes and marine environments and the precious biodiversity they hold. I have also seen how the remarkable ingenuity and talent across the Commonwealth can provide so many of the solutions, be it renewable energy in India, uh, regenerative agriculture in South Africa, green hydrogen in Australia, sustainable shipping in Barbados, reforestation in Rwanda, the marine economy in Fiji, or nature-based solutions in Canada, the Commonwealth is at the forefront of global innovation and action. For my part, I am determined to do what I can to support this vital effort, which is why I recently launched my Terra Carta to serve as the basis of a recovery plan for nature, people, and planet. The Commonwealth has been a cornerstone of my life for as long as I can remember. It is my dearest wish that it might also be the cornerstone of a sustainable future for us all. As we recover from everything that we have endured and continue to endure through this pandemic, we have an unprecedented opportunity to change course.
by harnessing the extraordinary potential of our Commonwealth family, we are uniquely placed to lead the way. So let us be the boldest of the bold, and let us offer an example to the world. I was lucky to grow up in one of the most forested regions in Kenya. And I remember planting my first tree at the age of seven and even being able to see clean streams that I could directly drink from. And I would say this connection made me develop a very strong love for nature. I got to feel angry about seeing people cutting down trees and even passing by places and finding people maybe throwing trash out of car windows. My name is Elizabeth Wathuti. I'm an environmentalist and a climate activist, and I'm working to create a livable world now and a safe future for all by inspiring the young generation. We want everyone to understand that nature is a part of us and not apart from us. Nairobi River has, of course, been polluted as a result of different challenges, and the contributors can be citizens and also bigger industries at the same time. So every person is a part of this problem. And so at one point in time, I took children to see the state of the pollution, and I remember that I could see the sadness in their eyes. I could see that they were very much devastated. And of course, two questions that these children asked me, and one of them was, who did this? And the other question they asked me was, what can we do about this? So I thought to myself, why not create a generation of young people who are environmentally conscious and who can have that chance to also connect to nature at a young age and love nature at a young age? And what happens when you love something? Are you going to destroy it? No. Are you going to interfere with it? No. If you love a tree so much, are you going to cut it down? No. I decided to begin a campaign that I dubbed Adopt a Tree Campaign, whereby I would ensure that every child in every school in my country gets a chance to plant and adopt a tree each in their school compound. It's not just about planting a tree. It's about planting a tree, watering it, nurturing it, and making sure that that tree grows up to maturity. Because just like we human beings need tenderness and we need love and we need all the care to survive, the same thing we need to put when it comes to how we address nature. Much of what I do is about changing people's mindsets and perspectives about appreciating the natural world. By working with young people in this way, I feel so much hope because the young people are courageously stepping up and standing up to shape the kind of future that they want to see. And this makes me feel hopeful about the future of this country and the future of the world. Sun. If I could sit with the sun, 
শেষ বিকেলে মতো অস্ত্র যেতাম অসীম রাতে সেই শেষ হয়নে সূর্যের সাথে আমি ঘুমিয়ে যেতাম সূর্যের সাথে আমি ঘুমিয়ে যেতাম Well, I won't be forgetting that in a hurry. Our thanks to Nithin Sawney for that beautiful performance. Now, the Duchess of Cornwall has a strong interest in reading and literacy and has launched an online reading room. She met with Claire Balding and Global Teacher Prize winner Ranjit Singh Disley from India in Poets' Corner here in Westminster Abbey. Sitting here in Poets' Corner with memorials to hundreds of wonderful writers, it seems the perfect place to discuss the importance of, of children's literacy. And it's a subject very dear to my heart as an author of children's books, and I know Your Royal Highness is something that you care about passionately. I've always had a passion for books. Uh, books have been part of my life for so long. I started reading when I was very, very young with a, with a father who was a fervent bibliophile. So from, from the age of two or three, he used to sit and read to us children, take us on wonderful adventures sort of all over the world. And I think I was bitten at that age. And from then, I've, I've just kept going. And I've got um, involved in a lot of literacy um, programs and patronages. And I, I just feel very strongly that all children should be taught to read. And getting access to books is, is crucial for that. And we're joined live on screen from India by Ranjit, who won the Global Teacher Prize for, for 2020. Ranjit, can I ask you, how have you tackled those challenges and how also have you made education fun? Because that's something you really believe in. Uh, uh, it was not an easy task for me. The girls were sitting at home, taking care of their little brothers and sisters, but no one was caring about girls' education. So I invited some girls from nearby cities, nearby villages, who were studying well, inviting them in the schools, and setting with them a role model before the parents. Now look at this girl. If they can do, it means your girl can do as well. It's now your responsibility to empower your daughter and give her her birthright of quality education. I've been doing some online reading, ma'am, with my, with my niece, who's 10. So she reads a bit of a book and I read a bit of a book. So we have the shared experience. And actually, for all that, you know, it has separated us, the, the pandemic, at least with the internet, we can be connected. And there's so much that becomes possible. Well, I, I have to admit, I have to put my hand up. So before lockdown, I wasn't a great lover of the internet. 
In fact, I, I was always trying to wrench these machines away from my grandchildren. But uh, since lockdown, I'm afraid I have, I have to admit I have become a little bit of an addict. During the first lockdown, um, I just thought it might be a good idea to, to make a list of some of my favourite books online, another asset of the internet. Um, so I launched a reading room, which is a book club, but it's, it's my reading room. It's fascinating how much it connects people all over the world. But you know. what it does as well is it creates a shared experience and I think that's what we've all been missing yeah. so much because yeah, exactly. we haven't been able to have it through yeah. sport or theatre yeah. or the usual yeah. outlet. Yeah. So actually lots of people reading the same book and then having, you know, quite an active conversation it about is. it. You could share it all, you yes. know. And I said, you, you, we've all been bereft of friends and a lot of people surrounding us. So it, it's nice to have a way of chatting. It is extraordinary, actually, how much more the internet has been able to, to give children and adults access to books. And, and Ranji, how has that um, impacted your students, being able to read online and being taught online? Yeah, they have experienced the power of internet as well. And reading online has actually improved them to expose themselves to new things. It also helped my students and improve their imagination. You know, there is no limit to imagination. What you can imagine, limitless. And also, it improves to reduce stress. Can I ask Ranjit one question? Um, there's a wonderful writing competition that I'm part of called the Queen's Commonwealth Essay Competition, where we get uh, uh, children from the Commonwealth to submit an essay and I think it'd be lovely if you could get your girls to join in and, and write an essay. I'm definitely uh, doing that. Thank you so much for giving me opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Your Highness, and thank you to Ranjit. Be you far or be you near, somehow for me you're always there. I say a prayer and sing a song I always know it won't be long. Be I alone or not, I know. I never am, you're ever close. From city side to countryside, to continent to country, I take pride in knowing that I have a love, the when below lifts me above. Together we, in unity, will be again in time to be. But tied we are by lines of love. Across the world, the tides are none. To separate the thing we share, that somehow always keeps us here. I know my loved ones far and wide will soon again be by my side. Though much we learn in times of woe, I know these days are soon to go. So come what comes, oh come what may, if you're with me, I'll be okay. Although we've been apart some days, here on the line, I know you'll stay. And one day soon, I know we'll sing about the former harder things, the troubles that we've all been through, that time and strength will take us through. To days of joy, and light and mirth, where'er you be upon the earth. So when you celebrate and do, know that we are here with you. Different parts of the Commonwealth have had very different experiences of COVID-19. In New Zealand, with low levels of transmission, life has continued as normal in many parts of the nation. This has allowed the New Zealand Youth Choir to keep singing and keep sharing their music. They recorded a special Maori song of greeting for us, a call of friendship despite the distance. Two hakangu 
roots. so joyful. Our thanks to the New Zealand Youth Choir. Now the 8th of March not only marks Commonwealth Day, it's also International Women's Day and the Countess of Wessex was joined by author and broadcaster June Sarpong and two female activists, Virginia Kunguni from Malawi and Caitlin Figueredo from Australia. Hello uh, everybody uh, and welcome. Hi Caitlin, how are you? I'm very good, Royal Highness. Hi Virginia, how are you? It's nice to see you again. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Brilliant. Now, of course, you're both uh, part of the Queen's Young Leaders. And what would be lovely, uh, Caitlin, uh, is if you could begin to tell us some of the work that you've done. Yes. So um, I run an organisation called Jaziri Australia. So we are a youth-led organisation operating in Commonwealth countries. So we're all about trying to change the face of leadership by providing young women with opportunities to be political leaders and policy change makers. Wonderful. Now, ma'am, I know for you, gender equality is something that you're very passionate about. Why do you think it's important to have organisations like this working at the grassroots to really empower uh, the next generation of female leaders? There's no end of passion from young people um, and there's no end of desire to want to do something. But often I think they find, um, what's my next step? How do I get involved? So for Caitlin to have created an organization to put them in front of people where they can start to feel that they're having an influence is astonishing. So Virginia, can you tell us a bit about the work that you do? Yes, I run an organization called Girls Arise for Change, uh, which works to promote girls to health and education by ending social and cultural practices that undervalues women's potential here in Malawi. I actually got to visit um, Virginia's one of Virginia's projects when I was in Malawi. Um, so I saw firsthand what they're actually doing with these young women. Um, and I think what's really important here is that she's helping them to create uh, training and business models that actually are appropriate to where they are. We need to train more women to become financially independent. That is by not by giving them money to run businesses, but by giving them the skill. Because when we give them a skill, 
the skill is a life it's a lifetime asset for them than giving them money um often women's voices are not heard at the top and we don't have a seat at the table not in the number that we should um how do we ensure that that becomes the norm especially with everything that we see happening with covid and the fact that actually we are regressing better policy and better outcomes are achieved when women are in the room when more than half the population are in the room and getting to make sure that all of their voices all of their issues are represented brilliant i love that and and ma'am would you like to add to that uh that can become a bit of a fatigue when it comes to talking about women's rights women's issues and everything and so i'm quite keen to try and move the discussion into a place where it becomes a much more level playing field because it is a win win it's not one against the other if we now can look at education particularly in in countries where virtual education isn't as easily available um what do we do to ensure that our young girls don't get left behind through this process where i am right now in malawi the majority of schools do not have online learning because many many students do not have laptops we can't even talk about internet so as we are going back to uh, developing education uh, through this covid pandemic we really have a very big job because we've had a setback it is a real worry because there's obviously a lot of the commonwealth countries that have got we're still trying to get girls into education where are the gaps going to be there what is going to be happening to those girls right now young people in particular they have those innovation mindsets they they want to support and they want to connect i always say as women we need to learn that we are not competitors but we are supporters of each other's progress so as women we should be able to share each other's skills women should be those that are in higher positions should open up to give opportunities to those, to those women that are coming those women that are inspiring and the commonwealth is a great force for good and i think if we can keep coming together and and talking to each other and using the technology that's now at our fingertips that really has proven its worth during this last year let's use that as a force for good On that note, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Caitlin. Thank you, Virginia. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, leading this conversation with you all, and continue the fantastic work. Sport plays an important role in the Commonwealth. Denise Lewis shared her experiences. I was born in West Bromwich, in the Midlands, to a Jamaican mother. Although we were immersed in an English way of life, there was always a tinge of Jamaican flavour in the house, whether it was music, cooking. or the patwa that would bellow out of my usually reserved mother's mouth when England played the West Indies cricket team. All these influences combined to give me a strong sense of my heritage and our commonwealth connection. Like many other athletes, my first experience of a major international competition was the Commonwealth Games. A games which are sometimes aptly referred to as the friendly games, but with a healthy balance of fierce competition. It's a tournament unlike any other with a strong spirit of unity permeating through every element. All of the competing countries share the bond of the Commonwealth. The national teams whose individual sports usually train apart all come together with disabled and non-disabled athletes uniting together to represent their countries. In 1994, I went into the heptathlon competition mentally unprepared to be crowned Commonwealth champion. And the games changed my life as they have done for many others before and since. I had the pride of returning to the games 4 years later as favorite, and retaining my title really was a dream come true. And like so many people around the Commonwealth, I can't wait for the games to return next year. For me, it will be like coming home to the city where my aspiration was forged, to the host city of Birmingham. This year all around the Commonwealth, the doors of gymnasiums were closed and the stadium lights were turned off. But in the face of adversity, giving up was never an option. Athletes have been demonstrating enormous resilience and resourcefulness, finding new ways to train as all our lives have been impacted. by the covid pandemic 
they have shown unwavering grit and determination to keep pushing towards their goals. I look forward to the enjoyment we will all share as our best athletes once again unite to display their exceptional talent and their years of hard work. I wish all competitors the very best of luck as we all look forward to witnessing once more the power of the Games to change lives as we celebrate the best of the Commonwealth.
simply sublime. Our thanks to Alexis French, gymnast Georgia May Fenton and Denise Lewis. And we all look forward to the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham next year. Now, the pandemic has been extremely hard for many of us, but one positive that it has shown are the networks of care that our communities are founded on. Now, many have been put under intense strain, but people across the world have adapted and worked hard to do all they can to help. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge have spoken to three inspirational voices from across the Commonwealth. Hello, my name is Dr. Zole Luas Fumba. I am a medical doctor and a frontline health worker all the way from South Africa, advocating for the healthcare workers in the world. Dr. Zola, can you hear us? Uh, hi. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Maybe could you give us both just a little bit of a, a brief picture of what it's like in South Africa at the moment with COVID? We're basically struggling and facing the brunt of it, I think, are the healthcare workers who are trying, you know, their best to be there and, and, and do all the work and get all the work done. But the problem is we are stressed as well. We are burnt out as well. We are burdened, you know. Um, and it's been like this for years. We have been exposed to occupational illnesses. I myself got multi-drug resistant tuberculosis as a medical student. It's been tough because of the circumstances that we've had to practice under anyway. And now the pandemic has put on a bit more, a lot more pressure. Salawa, here in the UK, there's been a massive sort of public recognition of the amazing work that the frontline are doing. And it, it's sad almost that it's taken the pandemic for the public to really back and support all those working on the front line. We actually know the problems. We see the problems every day. We walk into work, they're the problems. But the problem is our voices are not heard. We are on the front line and we are expected to lift humanity. So my advice to everybody is to, if you know a healthcare worker, any healthcare worker, you just love on them, love on them, love on them some more. <clears throat> If their child needs looking after, offer. You know, if they need a meal, offer. We, you know, Catherine and I have spoken to a lot of healthcare workers in the UK and around the world over the last year. And we hear your worries and your concerns. And, and thank you for your time chatting to us about it. Thank you, you know, for sharing for us and asking for help for us. So thank you very much. My name is Faisal Islam and I am the co-founder of Safeway, an affordable emergency medical service provider for the rural people of Bangladesh. Faisal, um, we've been hearing a little bit about your Safewheel idea. Can you tell us a little bit about it? So a couple of years ago, my best friend, uncle, had a road accident. And just because he couldn't manage an ambulance during that time, uh, he died because in our country, there are very few ambulances for rural people. So our solution is that we designed a low cost mini ambulance. So now they can get an ambulance with very affordable cost, unlike the regular ambulance. And we have planned to reach as many villages as possible and help more people. And, and how are your rickshaws kitted out? Uh, what we have is basic healthcare equipment like an oxygen cylinder and some other source of necessary equipment that uh, can save, save the patient during that emergency situation. Faisal, very nice to meet you. And you know, it's a fantastic idea and uh, we both wish it every success in the future. Thank you very much, Your Royal Highnesses. My name is Heidi Kwagik Lee and I'm the founder and director of Refuge for the Refugees a non-profit organization that seeks to raise awareness regarding the plight of refugees in Malaysia, as well as provide education for refugee children. Maybe you could just give us a little bit of a picture as to why your organization, Refuge for the Refugees, even needs to exist. What is it that's the situation like uh, in Malaysia that, that made you want to set this up? When refugees are here in Malaysia, they don't have access to education, healthcare, job opportunities. So they're often in limbo, you know, and not everyone gets resettled. If even if they do, the waiting process is anywhere between 10 to 15 years. And these kids, if they don't get access to education of sorts, they get left behind for a very long time. And Heidi, has the recent pandemic 
made it even more challenging, not only for you to carry out the work, but also for the refugee communities. The lockdown has been difficult because the reality is for the refugee and migrant community, um, they don't have access to Wi-Fi or internet or devices that allows you know, online engagement. So I think that has been hard. And Heidi, do you know how many refugees have benefited from your programmes? I guess in total, we have reached about um, close to 200,000 refugees. Wow, yeah. that's, a, that's a sizable amount of people you've reached and it's, um, it's fantastic what you're doing. And just a huge congratulations from Catherine and I, I think, in, yeah. in terms of what you're, what you're managing and, and, and dealing with. And especially now, obviously, with the extra challenges, but really well done, you're obviously a, a vital source and a vital support to, to all those um, refugee communities out there. So keep up the hard work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Nice to see you. Bye-bye. Take Bye -bye. care. <laughs>Thanks to Leanne Le Havers for that very special performance and to all our contributors that have been part of this unique Commonwealth celebration. We now hear from Commonwealth Secretary General Patricia Scotland. Let us pledge ourselves afresh to uphold the values of the Commonwealth, that every person possesses unique worth and dignity, that we should be good stewards of nature and of the whole earth, that there should be justice for everyone and peace between nations, that joining together as a worldwide family, we build on shared inheritances, that we cooperate with mutual respect and goodwill to deliver a common future for the good of all. And through Commonwealth Connection, we learn from one another and innovate to transform our communities, our nations and our world.
In this house of prayer, year by year, we celebrate our life as a commonwealth and as God's people. In the midst of a challenge that we all share, we ask for God's guidance and grace in looking for a better future that we can also share. It is our prayer that we might be agents of a deeper peace and a greater justice. So we ask for the gifts of an imagination that can hope abundantly and a courage to seize that hope. Confident in the richness and range of our Commonwealth today, we seek God's blessing that we might be a common people in a Commonwealth of grace. Lord God, hope of all the nations, when we feel isolated and alone, strengthen the bonds of our affection. When we face illness and death, renew our confidence in you. When fear and mistrust infect our words, renew us in the truth. And when we have great challenges before us, strengthen us. Bless, we pray, our Queen, the work of the Royal Commonwealth Society, and our shared witness that this Commonwealth of Nations may be a sign of the hope that is in us and a glimpse of the glory that you alone can give. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Forever and ever. Amen.
from the Jewish community in Canada. May the Almighty bless the Commonwealth. Sri Lanka visite Puduraj Mandaliye Samrum Dineet Tunuruangi Ashirwadi Labi Vai Apisit Patamu. God bless the Commonwealth from the Baha'i community in Zambia. Tirnduriya de Balak Sahib Sri Guru Danak Dev Sache Pacha Ji de Sarbat de Pale de Paigab on Sar Commonwealth Sare de Chali Sadguru Sache Pacha Ji. Mayor Paraya Hath Kirpa Badai Rakhana. God bless and protect the Commonwealth communities. We go on to the Lipo Kailis along the way. Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Pin Vinno, Jati, Dormo, Borno, or Shah's city, with Kirpati, Commonwealth, Virguji. May God bless all the people of the Commonwealth. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the Church, the Queen, the Commonwealth, and all people, peace and concord, and to us sinners, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen.
she made. That's an oath, and she's taken it seriously. Well, thank you once again for inviting us in. Thank you. the coming week, as we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity, and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. Whilst experiences of the last year have been different across the Commonwealth, stirring examples of courage, commitment, and selfless dedication to duty have been demonstrated in every Commonwealth nation and territory notably by those working on the front line who have been delivering health care and other public services in their communities. We have also taken encouragement from remarkable advances in developing new vaccines and treatments. The testing times experienced by so many have led to a deeper appreciation of the mutual support and spiritual sustenance we enjoy by being connected to others the need to maintain greater physical distance or to live and work largely in isolation 